So hello and welcome to Scientist Warning TV once again and today I'm very pleased to have with me again um, my colleague and friend Rupert Reed. So Rupert is no stranger to you, most of you will know about Rupert from his earlier days as a one of the key spokespeople for Extinction Rebellion. Um, he's been, been a green campaigner for some time and as of recently he was um, a professor at University of East Anglia specialising in philosophy. So Rupert, welcome. Good to see you again Alison. So now tell me what's been happening with you. So note that you are formerly an academic. Um, mm. I think it'd be really interesting if you could tell us a little bit about what motivated that really momentous decision to quit a successful academic career and to move into something different. So perhaps you yeah. could tell us a bit about your motivations. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so obviously um, the, uh, the the teat of the uh, of the academic um, uh, support system that is a hard thing to uh, to let go of. Um, but I'm delighted to have finally done so. It felt like the right time. Why? Well, partly because, and perhaps we'll talk about this, the world situation is worse than ever, and that requires people to step up even more than they've done so far, and partly connectedly with that. It just became clear to me that really to fulfil my life's purpose fully, to really do what I'm called to do, I needed to let go of the continued crutch of uh, academic employment and just really devote myself to uh, to the cause of uh, of a future more directly uh when i left extinction rebellion in 2020 i started moving on as you know to co-create a, a new moderate flank uh that's now taken form through the climate majority project i'm the co-director of that we've got some uh, some funding so i'm not completely uh, adrift in case people are worried uh and um yeah, that's what I'm doing now. I'm devoting myself to seeking to change the world more directly. Uh, and uh, I've got various kinds of uh, concerns about the uh, the academic system in terms of the the um, constraints it puts upon people wishing to, to do that sort of thing. The academic world in many ways was very kind to me and mm. you know, I achieved a number of things uh, through it and that's all great. Uh, but I think that um, it is a good moment, certainly a good moment for me to reflect upon some of the limits of uh, of the university uh, system. Uh, and yeah, I've written about that recently on uh, Brave New Europe and people mm -hmm. have been quite interested in that. I, I guess that was the motivation really for us to have this conversation today. It was. And and just to go back on on that decision you've made, it's it's a courageous and it's a noble decision. There aren't a great many people who who have done something like that, who quit a successful academic career. As you know, I mean, I did something similar five years ago. And yeah. and I did that in the context of the early days of XR. And, you know, reflecting on those days, you were very much a mentor to me. Um, oh, I learned I learned you. a lot. Mm. I learned a lot from working with you. So I very much mm. appreciate that. Mm. Um Yes. And like you, I, I share your disappointment in academia. And in our previous conversation, um, we talked a little bit about how important it is for academics, not just scientists, but academics in their totality, yeah. to acknowledge and recognise that they have a part to play. And, and in the two years since we had that previous conversation, have you observed progress in academia? Have you mm. have you observed more people actually embracing that responsibility? Well, a little bit, uh, but progress is is so slow, and the change in the climate and ecological system. Well, it's also slow, but it, it's speeded up recently, and yeah. So, I wish more people in academia were willing to say to their students things like don't expect that you're necessarily going to have you know a normal career uh don't expect that uh, the future is going to be like the past i wish more academics were willing to break with the thought constraining ideology of uh, of anthropocentrism which i think deforms still nearly all of academia which is which is you know very disappointing really um 
at the uh, University of East Anglia, for example, and I don't think it's exceptional. In fact, I think the UEA is, if anything, better than the average university because of its historic strength in environmental science and in nature writing. Uh, at the University of East Anglia, I, I found that even recently, as more and more colleagues have been forced to pay attention at last to the uh, the climate devastation uh, that is here and, and the much worse devastation that is coming, they still find it very difficult to escape from a frame of thinking that basically what they should be researching and teaching is all about human beings. And it might seem in subjects like the humanities and the social sciences that that's how it should be. But I think that that's a really fake perspective now. We have to take so much more seriously our utter embeddedness in the natural world, our total dependence uh, upon it. And basically, a, a lot of people in the humanities and the social sciences are living in a sort of fantasy world where the future is going to be like the past. The left right spectrum is what really matters. Issues of identity politics are supposedly mm -hmm. extremely important. All of this is sort of a, 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 almost an irrelevance now. Uh, it, it's it's secondary. It and is. what's and what's primary ought to be taking up the attention of people who are supposed to be intelligent enough to actually think about what is and talk about what is without fear or favour. So that's, if you will, the heart of my disappointment with academia. Now, that leaves, of course, the, the natural uh, sciences. And, um, well, even there, you know, things are far from perfect. Mm -hmm. There are many who are still trying not to frighten the horses, still practising some degree of scientific reticence, still not facing up, for example, to the extent to which uh, when we talk about climate, we need to focus much more now on adaptation mm -hmm. and not fixate the whole time on uh, on mitigation. Um, there, there are still there's still an alarming number of academics who are um, pretending that something like the the COP system and the UNFCCC is even remotely uh, fit for purpose, uh, and uh, who are effectively giving cover to governing elites by doing so. Mm -hmm. So if you will, my um, call for academics to step into reality to a greater extent is a call across the piece. Really, uh, the only subject which I think would escape, escape scrutiny probably is mathematics. Yeah. Uh, everybody else uh, is in some way or another quite crucially uh, off the pace. And that's what I was trying to say in my Brave New Europe piece. And um, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, absolutely. I personally, I think everyone should take a take a leaf out of Melanie Challenger's book. Um, you know, she writes very eloquently about human exceptionalism and how that's actually yes. become yes. problematic for us. Um, we don't have time to cover all that at the moment, but I think there's some incredibly interesting ideas in terms of you know in in what she says, and also in in what you write about too. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just take you back now to the exciting news about your your new funded project, the Climate Majority Project. Mm. Um, can you say a little bit about how it differs from XR and also, yeah. about, you know, what is at the heart of the Climate Majority Project and what is your theory of change? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So the basic idea is that there is already a climate majority, there's already a majority of concerned people. And opinion polls are very clear about that. And that was part of the achievement of XR and the Fridays for Future uh, in 2019, making that a reality uh, and that reality continues to grow but it doesn't grow uh, fast enough or deep enough the people's engagement with the truth uh, with the difficult reality needs to be deepened further that is painful and difficult so people's eco emotions which are totally rational needs to be resourced that includes by the way in in universities mm -hmm. it should become a matter of course now that the teaching of ecology and climate science and uh, similarly in disciplines like philosophy and politics and so forth should be accompanied in some way or another by resourcing for students whether that be sort of group counseling as an option or whatever there's all sorts of different ways you could do it but what we're saying is that has to be done that's so this is our campaign on eco anxiety we can't throw people into the terrible reality of where we are now and just expect them to 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 swim uh, they may well sink without uh, help uh, and uh, i'm sure that you're well aware as i am of the uh, very large numbers of uh, of younger people especially 
who are feeling desolate uh, about the situation. Um, help with that needs to be built in from now on to everything uh, that we do. So we need to tell the truth more fully. And in this way, of course, we're, we're with uh, the old uh, radical flank. Uh, we need to resource that truthfulness. We need to provide pathways to activation for the majority of people, not just for the small minority who may become activists or the tiny minority who may join the radical flank, but for the majority of people. And that means providing this kind of potential for meaningful collective action everywhere where people are collectively together with each other. So whether that's in a university or in a church or where people live, you know, everybody lives somewhere. There's huge potential for action in communities, action uh, of a resilience building and adaptational nature is absolutely crucial at this point and, and serves the wonderful purpose of waking everybody else up. So when people see people engaging in adaptation activities, they're like, oh, so this isn't just about 2050 or whatever. This is happening now and people are taking self-protective measures now. It must be real. Uh, and perhaps most crucially of all in uh, workplaces, in professions, uh, in businesses, uh, that's our other big campaign that we're doing at the moment, um, uh, reaching out to business. It's called Regulate Us. The basic idea is businesses need to say, look, we haven't got the power to fix this by ourselves. What we have got the power to do is lobby government to place us in a policy and regulatory environment, which would actually be adequate to the really serious situation uh, that we are now uh, in. So for many people, the most meaningful way to become part of this climate majority will be to take action with their fellow employees or in the business where, where they work or that they own or in their professional setting, talking here about uh, lawyers, academics, obviously, um, insurers, uh, and so forth. Uh, yeah, so hopefully that gives you a clue. And that, that's the third part of our theory of change. And then the fourth and final part is seeing that all of this is already happening, understanding that you are part, that we are part of an inevitable growing wave of action, which is going to be far bigger uh, even than Fridays for Future, let alone than uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion, um, something which needs to sweep across the whole of this society and every society. That may sound very ambitious. Well, that's the level of ambition that we need uh, because the climate crisis is a total uh, crisis. It saturates every aspect of our lives pretty much. It's not like the ozone hole, something you can fix with a bit of elite action and technological and corporate um, alteration. Uh, it's something that requires everybody on board uh, with permission to, uh, to change it and with determination to change the situation. And that's why an important aspect of what we're trying to bring in the Climate Majority Project is the idea that unlike the radical flank, we need to be depolarizing in what we do. We need to be lowering uh, the tension, not always uh, raising it. Um, so there's a, a seeming paradox here. We're being quite blunt and clear about how tough the truth is. Uh, and we're saying that we have to uh, depolarize. But it really isn't a paradox because we think that people are ready for the truth. And that, of course, is what's uh, very interesting in this report by our collaborator that's just out. Uh, people Get Real have produced this um, like report to... based on an opinion poll. Yeah. yeah, shall I go on or did you want to? No, 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 I just want yeah. to pause a little bit. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's a good report and I, and I absolutely want to get onto that. Yes. Some interesting findings from that survey. But yes, it's worth just to say that, yes, I mean, yes, it's more than about time that we did have a project that was actually geared towards the majority of people because mm. as you and I both know, you know, the radical flank has its place. I think it does still have a place. I think that there are still people who are more inclined to the kind of radical action Mm. Like, like XR, like Just Stop Oil, controversial as they are. But as you say, what, what, where does that leave the majority? Where does that leave people like my next door neighbours, your next door neighbours, who yeah. are, as you say, profoundly concerned, wanting to get involved and not necessarily knowing how to do that? Exactly. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and I, as I'm sure the, the viewers will too, that yes, mitigation is important, but... Mm -hmm. We cannot we cannot change the fact that these things are going to be coming down the line at us, you know, yeah. rather rather more quickly. Yeah. We'll probably get onto that when we talk about the record breaking temperatures we've seen lately. Um, so I think it's a fantastic an initiative, and good luck mm. to you with that. 
Um, no, the People Get Real report, which um, which I read yesterday, had some very interesting findings in it. And there's a couple that I just wanted to, to talk with you about. Yeah. And obviously invite you to talk about other aspects, too. Now, the report talks about one in five, probably one in five of the, of the sample. So I think it was something like 9,000 plus people were, were surveyed. Yes. One in five people surveyed believe that it's already too late, that we have actually already missed that 1.5, that target of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, which is itself an interesting observation. And a similar number, around one in five, also believe that um, technology will save us. And you have two you have two extremes represented there. What yes. I find interesting about the report is 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 the um is a focus on the one point five as potentially a fruitful group with whom to work. Now, some might say, why would you work with people who already believe that one point five is gone? Because would that group not be despairing? Would that group not be, in mm. some sense, less active mm. than a group of individuals who mistakenly believe? that technology will save us. So I just want, I'm just, I'm curious about that and just invite you to talk us through the, that report, which I thought was really very interesting. Yeah, well, look, I'm uh, one of the uh, people who believe that 1.5 is definitely gone. Uh, and uh, uh, more and more, it's impossible to find um, a scientist who, at least in private, will actually say they believe there's a, a Stobel's chance in hell of uh, staying below 1.5. I mean, let's go directly to those crazy uh, temperatures. Uh, we went through uh, um, days and then weeks of above 1.5 temperatures um, this summer, and then recently we went through uh, uh, we went through um, some days of above two degrees of average global overheat here on the Earth. I mean, this is crazy off the scale stuff, as one um, scientist memorably put it: uh, gobsmackingly bananas. Um, which is quite, you know, uh, humorous about a subject which is far from mm -hmm. from humorous. Um, you were saying before we started talking, Alison, how you had sometimes been really quite depressed about the situation recently. I've been the same. I, I had a real episode of, of eco-anxiety, um, climate anxiety, several weeks ago. Um, these episodes, for me, they don't last as long as they used to. I used to get stuck in them for weeks or even months uh, on end. I can usually get through them now in a couple of days. That's basically because uh, I've got a lot of experience with getting through them. And because I know that what I'm doing is what I need to be doing to respond um, to uh, that situation. So look, the one of the really interesting things about the People Get Real report was that they showed that those who think that the window is closed for a safe and livable future for all. And that's a really, you know, that's a really kind of terrifying thing to admit, an awful thing to admit to oneself, that those people are more likely than the rest of the sample uh, to be up for taking serious climate action, including mitigation, activism, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that is itself a really interesting and encouraging uh, result. What, but for me, the most important part in the whole uh, report uh, and the whole of the Ipsos poll uh, is the information that suggests that while there's uh, a lot of people in this country who want to be, uh, if possible, to be given kind of positive uh, uh, vibes around what can be done to be offered solutions, et cetera, there's an even larger percentage, an overwhelming percentage who want to be told the truth about what's going on, even if there is no positive spin on it, even if there is no grounds for optimism in the in the relevant bit of uh, of truth telling, um, and that supports one of the fundamental thoughts that has motivated, well, certainly motivated me for a long time now, which is at the end of the day, people want, need, and are able to handle the truth, especially if you help give them the resources to do so, going back to what I said earlier about yeah. resourcing the the natural phenomenon uh, now of uh, of eco anxiety. I, I, I agree. I'd, I'd I'd like to jump in there because this is it's a super important point. Yeah. And as you know, telling the truth was at the the heart of XR. Um, yes. And it's a really important. It's a really important um, strand to the climate majority project. Now, arguably, scientists would say that they are telling the truth, that they are telling it as it is. Um, 
and you know if you if you consider the the way that the media presents the news so for example channel 4 tend to be rather better than some of the other outlets mm. and then they've talked about record breaking temperatures so there is a sense in which the truth is out there um now i was struck recently by some comments made by peter lynch who recently won the booker prize and and he talked about this not about climate change but talked about how how you can actually get people to feel and hear and receive a message. Yeah. But you can't actually do it by simply telling it to them, telling it yes. in a sort of factual way. It has to be done yes. in a particular way. And he he talked about the importance of storytelling. Absolutely. And so, and so I wonder whether within the Climate Majority Project, yes, tell the truth, but what kind of thought and and work are you putting into how do you communicate that truth in a way that that, that it lands in, in such a way that people can feel it? Because I remember yeah. Roger Hallam talking about this with a you know in a in an interview, and he talked to, um, with the interview about um, how the words were simply being said, but that the person talking with him was not feeling it. Yeah. That, yeah. So I I just I'd be yeah. interested to hear your thoughts on how the the, 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 the message is communicated. Well, what a great and rich question, Alison. Thank you. So let me start just briefly averting back to the the climate majority project theory of change. So part of what we think is you can enable the truth to be heard if you hold people uh, in the hearing of, if you help them to handle it, if you ensure that they have the sense that there are meaningful things that they can do along with other people about it. And if you help them to see that other people are already doing that and they're, they're not alone as they often fear uh, that they are and it's not hopeless. Um, but more broadly, I would say uh, another important aspect of what we're trying to bring in the Climate Majority Project is indeed around the theme of storytelling and uh, enabling people to inhabit and imagine um, scenarios. Now, that can happen in all sorts of ways. One way it can happen is simply through people doing and then noticing other people or themselves engaging in uh adaptation, transformative adaptation, resilience building, etc. Because that ses sets one down a different path, right, in one's imagination, rather than thinking something like, hmm, what are the policy changes or what are the technologies which are going to enable us to go net zero by 2050 or 2035 or something? You rather think in, instead things along the lines of, hmm, what's this preparation for? Well, we know a lot of what it's for, right? It's for the next uh, terrible drought or potential food shortages or potential floods, you know, whatever it is that you're building resilience in relation uh, to water shortages, things that are going to be coming a lot more to countries like this one, wildfires, you know, the, the pitiful level of preparation we have in this country for, uh, for wildfires, which will surely be coming in nasty ways at some point during the next um, several years. When people engage in preparations in relation to these things, they're, they're almost engaging in a sort of embodied version of a sort of imaginal practice. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that, of course, can be complemented by literal promulgation and inhabitation of, uh, of scenarios. Um, uh, and by literal, I mean people spelling it out, right? And that's one thing I think is really important. You know, what is it to tell the truth? You know, do you tell the truth if you just give some very kind of dry, emotion free uh, picture of what's changing in the climate and how things are likely to look in, say, 10 years time on a business as usual path or on a better uh, path? And I think it's very important, by the way, that we always offer people the sense of different possible paths. It could look like this or it could look like could look like that. I think that isn't really um, well described as telling the truth. I think to actually tell the truth, you actually have to give people that meaningful sense of what those different paths would look like. You have to help them to inhabit it. And of course, scientists themselves are not necessarily very good at this. Um, and this can also be related to, to thinking about um, the contrast between uh, looking at things in a precautionary frame or a risk analysis frame on the one hand and looking at things in a standard scientific frame uh, on the other hand. Simon Sharp is very good on this in his uh, in his recent book, Five Times Faster. When scientists, uh, as they see it, tell the truth about um, where we're at and what's coming climate wise, they engage uh, generally in uh, a practice of being very careful not to say anything that they can't prove. But that means that they don't actually succeed in warning 
because they don't actually succeed in evoking the potential um, scenarios or possible futures that they can't prove, let alone make them uh, vivid to people. Mm -hmm. We need more precautionary thinking and we need more risk analysis and we need less risk averse standard uh, science because we're not in a standard situation. You know, we're in a situation with extremely uh, high stakes where precautionary uh, action and uh, embodied risk aversion uh, in society is what is really required. Yeah. And finally, I would say um, this also ties in, uh, as I've already hinted, with the way in which there is a huge potential role here for, in academic terms, the humanities, in cultural terms, uh, uh, the arts, um, entertainment. Um, we need people to, to tell stories about uh, uh, reality-based stories, stories based in also understandings of, of different possible risks and opportunities that are coming about our possible futures. Yeah. Uh, and the frame that I use for this is this idea of uh, throughtopia, that utopias as a kind of direction of, uh, of travel are no longer credible, unfortunately. Uh, dystopia is where we are headed, but it's not enough to just tell people dystopian stories. Obviously, if you do that, they'll just be dispirited. So we need a sense of how we can get through what is coming in the best way possible. And that's through topia. We need through topian stories and scenarios to be laid out and inhabited in all sorts of ways by all sorts of people. But above all, by those who are really expert in the creation of stories and, uh, and narratives. So that's those uh, creative writers and so forth. And if we do that and enable people to, to inhabit stuff, well, that is part of what I call telling the truth. Mm, okay, thank you. Um We've just a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to turn to you now for um, a couple of final remarks on perhaps your hopes or anticipations, thoughts about the COP, because COP, of course, starts today and it's been yeah. fraught with controversy. You know, the COP president who seems to have an ulterior motive. Um, so thoughts on the COP or anything else you might wish to to close on? Yeah, well, look, I've said for some time that the COP process, I mean years, that the COP process is um, failed. Um, the best thing that the COP delegates could do now is say, we don't have the power to uh, to to do what's needed here. Uh, we, we are, you're investing false hope in us if you think we can fix this. Uh, I don't think they'll ever do that because certainly my experience when I was at COP26 is that the amount of self-importance within the official blue zone uh, is absolutely vast and there, there is no willingness yet to to face up to failure even the wonderful Antonio Guterres he still he still continues to talk about how we just need to step up our ambition and we can stay below 1.5 and so on it's hopium it's it's not true so what do I think should happen? I, I think the COP28 should be boycotted. I think it was always obvious it was going to be an absolutely disgraceful, corrupt farce. Mm -hmm. And we've now learned that, surprise, surprise, that is the case. We need a new process. Simon Sharp talks about, talks about some of the changes that are needed in five times faster. Um, I've called for a, uh, for a breakaway strategy. I've said nations that are actually serious about doing the right thing, now is the right time for them to get together in smaller groups where they can actually agree on something meaningful rather than be held up by the laggards, which is always what ha what's happened uh, at COP, uh, and um, chart a way forward which could actually be enough uh, and dare the work the rest of the world not to uh, to join them, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and that would be obviously an enormously powerful way of uh, of suggesting that the uh, the COP process is failed and that until we admit failure we're never in a position to start something that can actually succeed and in the meantime uh what we need to do is we need to do stuff which is actually going to make a difference rather than investing uh our hopes in a failed process so we need to do things like you know act uh at, at, in in climate majority style ways um, there's our Regulate Us campaign, there's our Eco-Anxiety campaign. There are loads of organisations which are part of this emerging climate majority. You know, the Climate Majority Project is just trying to sort of name and network and support this huge emergent phenomenon uh, across uh, civil society groups like MP Watch and Wildcard, across the professions, organisations like Lawyers for Net Zero, across uh, the, the vast field of uh, of community climate action and 
rural resilience hubs and so on, so on and so forth. There's an enormous amount to do. Um, it's great in a way that one has COP every year because it gives us a chance to, to talk about these things. Um, but that's about the only good thing uh, about it. Um, COP is uh, as dead as, as 1.5. Uh, and the sooner people get to facing up to that reality, the better. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, as always, a very pithy conversation, Rupert, um, and and you know, and some straight talking, which is which is exactly what we need. I think what you've done is 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 very skillfully put some some bones on this point, which is often made, which is that you know, as humans, we have agency, yes, and, and that's where the conversation often ends. But what do people do with their agency? And mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. what you're doing is is giving people an answer to that question. So thank you so much for your time. Um, thank we'll, you. We'll put the links to the Climate Majority Project Please. and the other information in the the, um, the description for this interview. Um, so with a, you know fingers crossed, well more than fingers crossed, you know people should <laughs> people should be signing up and and getting involved in the Climate Majority Project and looking. Yeah. Thanks for that, Alison. Yeah, it's a question now of, you know, what, what do we commit our lives to? You know, you and I have both uh, joined the small but increasing number of people who have decided we need to commit our lives to something outside uh, the academic sphere. For those who are still in the academic world, they need to, to step up in the ways that we've talked about. And for everybody else, it's about committing yourselves as well. And yeah, we hope that the Climate Majority Project is offering a, a way in which those commitments can be realised more easily. Thank you. Thank you, Rupert. Thank you so much for your time. Cheers.